Good afternoon. It is four o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon. I am Valerie Bird Fort, and I'm so excited to be here today for Dr. Cook. Welcome to the Spring 2021 Baker Diversity Series. I'm an instructor for the School of Information Science at the University of South Carolina, and I'm so glad to be here. Before we get started, I've got some housekeeping for you. Um, we are in listen only mode. So if you have questions, please feel free to look in your um, dashboard and find the question tab and there you can type questions and we will be keeping track. Um, Dr. Cook's GA is here and we will both be keeping track of those questions and there will be time after um, today's talk with Dr. Dolan and um, we'll get to those questions after our talk. Um, also, if you have trouble with sound, please refer back to the email confirming your registration and find the phone number to use to dial in. That may be able to um, help you hear us a bit better. Um, I've already mentioned we can't chat with one another. We're in listen-only mode and with the chat feature, um, you can not uh, talk with each other during the talk, but you can ask a question, like I said. There will be a recording and a transcript posted on the Diversity Lecture website um, after our talk, not immediately, but in about a week or so, so stay tuned for that. Um, and now I'd like to welcome our speaker and something uh, that is just kind of interesting about Dr. Dolan is she spoke at the South Carolina Association of School Librarians Conference, March 2020, and I had the pleasure of being a part of that um, conversation with her and, and got to meet her. And it was actually one of the last things um, that I did professionally or socially, like in person <laughs> um, before the world shut down. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to see you again. Um, I wish that it was face to face again. Um, but Dr. Dolan is an associate professor in the Master of Library and Information Science program at St. Catherine University in St. Paul, Minnesota, where it is very cold. Uh, she teaches courses on youth materials and library services, storytelling, and library science. Her work focuses on diversity in children's literature, and that is what we will be talking about today. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to her now. Uh, I look forward to your questions, and I really look forward to hearing this today. Thank you for being here. Okay, well, thank you all for being here. And as Valerie said, my last visit pre-COVID was to South Carolina. And so um, being back here virtually now to give a Baker lecture, is it just means a lot to me um, to be here in this space with Dr. Cook, with Valerie, with Grace. Um, thank you all so much for setting up this talk and to all of you who could be watching the Mars landing instead. Um, so portions of this talk are taken from the Asian American Youth Literature textbook that I'm writing with, uh, co-writing with Paul Lai. My title is inspired by an article by Debbie Reese and Jean Mendoza examining multicultural picture books for the early childhood classroom, Possibilities and Pitfalls, which was published exactly 20 years ago. Okay, let's begin with a story. In 2016, after a long day of racism-related panels and meetings, at the Children's Literature Association, or CHLA conference, my colleague Ebony Elizabeth Thomas and I were joined in the hotel lounge by a white woman who we've known for over 15 years and who has served on the board of CHLA. She started telling us about her layover in Korea on her way to China. This is our conversation about her meal at the Incheon airport. She said, they served, what's that Korean meat dish? I said, bulgogi. She said, what? I said, bulgogi. She said, what? I said, bulgogi. She said, yeah, whatever that, that was good. But the kimchi, ew. She screwed up her face in a look of disgust. So what I'm sharing today is both personal and academic. In our time together, I'll map a brief trajectory of Asian American youth literature and explain how at present, we might consider that we're in a golden age of Asian American youth literature uh, publishing or how our current Asian American children's book creators might comprise a celebrated cohort as Min Hyung Song writes of Asian American literature, that is literature written for adults. Next, I'll push back on this notion by addressing how two topics in Asian American children's literature 
continue to distort and other Asian Americans. So why might we consider this a golden age? The John Newberry Medal, the most prestigious award for American children's literature, was established in 1922. A few years later, in 1928, when there were relatively fewer Asian people here in the country currently known as the United States, a South Asian man, Don Gopal Mukherjee, was the first Asian American to receive the Newberry Medal. The next Asian American winner of the Newberry Medal wouldn't be until 2002. Pooja Makijani writes about how the 1924 anti-immigration laws that banned Asians from immigrating to the U.S. potentially stunted the growth of Asian American youth literature. Had the ban not been in place, there might be more Asians in the U.S. and consequently, there might be more Asian American children's books. According to historian Eric Lee, the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act changed the course of Asian American and U.S. history by lifting the 1924 quotas, opening the door to millions of immigrants. Consequently, because more Asians were in the United States, more Asian American writings emerged. In The Children of 1965, on writing and not writing as an Asian American, Min Song addresses works by Asian Americans who were born in or after the 1960s and are now, quote, part of the largest and most celebrated cohort of American writers of Asian ancestry ever to exist, end quote. Asian American youth literature may be approaching a similar celebrated cohort as measured by both popularity and critical acclaim. Asian American children's literature has grown, indeed exploded, in the 21st century, but began as a trickle in the first half of the 20th century. Suisun Farr's Tales of Chinese Children, published in 1912, is generally considered the first Asian American story for young people because it is written by a person of Asian descent living and writing about living in the United States. Today, we would call this hashtag own voices, a term coined by Dutch writer Karen Duvis to identify books where the protagonist shares some characteristics with the book's creator. In subsequent years, uh, folk tales from Asian cultures, fiction, and nonfiction children's books explaining Asian cultures, countries, and peoples to, no to non-Asian white American children dominated the landscape. After the civil rights movement, there emerged more fictional and autobiographical stories by and about Asians and Asian Americans. So the proportion of folk tales and nonfiction to fiction has become more balanced. As Rafio Davis and Dolores de Manuel point out in the 2006 special issue of The Lion and the Unicorn, writing Asian American children's literature is a political project in which Asian Americans write themselves into the landscape of American children's literature because they want the next generation to see themselves reflected in the books they read, an experience unavailable to them in their youth. By the 1990s, we saw a fairly small, predictable, and stable body of literature, including folktales, fiction, and nonfiction, addressing topics such as immigration, learning English, the Lunar New Year, and Japanese incarceration. In 2002, only 91 children's books about Asian Americans were published. By 2019, the number quadrupled to 328, but the increase is a smidgen compared to the approximately 3,400 American children's books that are received annually by the University of Wisconsin Madison School of Education's Cooperative Children's Book Center, or the CCBC. On this chart, books written by Asian Americans are represented by the solid green line, while books about Asian Americans are represented by the dashed green line. In terms of authorship, what, in, in 2002, the CCBC reported that only 46 books were written by Asian Americans, while 91 were about Asian Americans. Interestingly, by 2019, 300 180 books were written by Asian Americans and 328 were about Asian Americans, making us the only group where the by number is bigger than the about number. Also, consider that the CCBC counts only inclusion, not quality. So even if we have parity or so-called overrepresented in youth literature, that doesn't necessarily mean the books are accurate or well-written. As Rudine Sims Bishop writes, we need mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors so we can see mirrors of our own experiences as well as windows onto other people's experiences. And those mirrors and windows shouldn't distort our images through fractured glass. The distortions are represented here by shattered mirrors. Over the decades, Asian Americans have won significant awards. Lawrence Yep won two Newbery Honors and the Children's Literature Legacy Award, whose purpose is to honor an author or illustrator whose books have made, a, over a period of years, a substantial and lasting contribution to literature for children. In 2002, Linda Sue Park became the second Asian American to win the Newbery Medal with A Single Shard, a novel in 12th, set in 12th century Korea. 
Cynthia Katohara received the Newbery Medal for Kira Kira, Erin Entrada Kelly won the Newbery Medal for Hello Universe, and this past January, we learned that Korean American Tay Keller won the Newbery Medal for When You Trap a Tiger. In, term of recent, in terms of recent Newbery honors, Vera Heron Andani won a Newbery honor for The Night Diary, which takes place during the 1947 partition of India, a topic rarely shared with young people. Again, just this past January, two Asian Americans won Newbery honors, Erin Entrada Kelly for We Dream of Space, and Christina Suntrenbat won two Newbery honors for All 13 and A Wish in the Dark, marking the first time that Asian Americans were so well represented in a single year. All 13 also won a host of other awards, including a Cybert honor. In terms of the Caldecott Medal, which is awarded to the artist of the most distinguished American picture book for children, in 1990, Ed Young was the first Asian American to win a medal for Lan Po Po, a Red Riding Hood story from China. Alan Say won the medal for Grandfather's Journey, and Dan Santat won the medal for The Adventures of Beagle. Since 1955, 10 Asian American artists have won Caldecott honors. In 1993, Junko Yokoda wrote, the, the outlook for quality Asian American literature is better than it has been. Today, nearly 30 years la later, if we're measuring by number of books published and awards won, we might think Asian Americans are doing well in youth literature publishing, especially this year when three Asian Americans took home four Newberries. We seem to be on a positive trajectory with this explosion of nuanced, diverse, high quality storytelling. But I wanna now contrast this with two strands of a single story that continue to trouble youth literature depicting Asian Americans. The two problems are the use of slanted eyes to depict an Asian person in illustrations and the othering and yucking of Asian food. Asian bodies or non-white bodies more broadly have been a topic of fascination for centuries. One of the main ways that Asian Americans are othered in children's literature is through the body. Common racist stereotypes include slanted eyes, yellow skin, and rice bowl haircuts. The persistence of these stereotypes, which too often serve as shorthand for Asianness in picture books, continues to orientalize and belittle our literature and by extension, us. But where do these stereotypes come from? The idea that Asian people have small eyes, often depicted as small, angled, slanted, or as mere, mere lines, appeared alongside the idea that Asians are yellow. According to Michael Kivak in Becoming Yellow, A Short History of Racial Thinking, people labeled those they encountered in Asian countries as yellow in opposition to the white people in the West. Kivak writes that in the 1600s, quote, it had become necessary to ensure that Asians were safely distanced from a whiteness that only the West was allowed to embody and a whiteness that was beginning to be defined at exactly the same time, the end quote. Theories about skin color developed in tandem with so-called scientific research regarding cranial studies on head shape and brain size, supposedly proving that white Europeans were more intelligent and developed compared to the people inhabiting Africa and Asia. And as an aside, ideas about blackness actually, you know, they developed at the same time, um, for example, comparing Asians and blacks, um, black people with monkeys. Um, and you can learn more about this on Edith, Camp Edith Campbell's blog. She's studying this right now. In the 16th century, people began to observe that Asians had an epicanthic fold, leading them to write that East Asians had little eyes, though the term of the so-called Mongolian eye would not come into use until the late 19th century. Kivak observes that, quote, European commentators considered the most distinguishing physical characteristic of the people of the Far East to be the shape of their eyes, end quote, and that they struggled to find the right words to explain the little or narrow or sunken eyes that people of the the region were steps. They were also described as slanted and little pig's eyes and were connected to contemporary ideas about the relationship of the races to human evolution. That is, because Asian people tended to have epicanthic folds, they must not have been as developed as white people and therefore sat lower on the scale of development and perfection. The so-called Mongolian spot on Asian babies' bottoms and Mongolism, what we know today as Down syndrome, were supposedly further indicators that Asians had stunted development. Kiva connects these racist ideas about Asian bodies to the threat of yellow peril. Erica Lee writes that yellow peril is the quote, long-standing European fear of an oriental invasion of the West, end quote. The idea of yellow peril has existed for centuries, but became more pronounced and was named in 1895 when Japan defeated China in the Sino-Japanese War, leading German Kaiser Wilhelm II to worry that the Japanese specifically and Asians more broadly were going to take over the world. He thus coined the term yellow peril and commissioned a painting titled, People's of Europe, Defend Your Holiest Possessions. 
Images of yellow Asians with slitted and slanted eyes violently threatening the West circulated in political cartoons in the late 1800s, helping to fuel the anti-Chinese sentiment that led to the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. In 2009, in Asian Americans and the media, Kent Ono and Vincent Fa warned, quote, yellow peril has not faded away into the depths of history. Rather, yellow peril has persisted throughout the 20th century and continues into the 21st. Though Asian people are not yellow, and though not every Asian person has an epicanthic fold, these notions are so fixed and pervasive that white actors playing Asian people painted their skin yellow and taped down their eyelids to imitate the so-called shape of Asian eyes. White people continue to mock Asian eyes in a variety of media, one of the most well-known being when Miley Cyrus pulled her eyes back while sitting next to someone who appeared to be Asian. Ono and Pham ask rhetorically, quote, why do non-Asian and non-Asian American children taunt Asians and Asian Americans by pulling their eyelids back? They have learned somewhere that Asians, that Asian eyes are slitted, so pulling their eyes back in act of meanness and mockery makes them, quote, look Asian. The fact that people use this racist symbol confirms its persistence in media and society. These media representations are in fact what Ono and Pham call media media constructions. That is, they are created, produced, and manufactured, and then made intelligible because their repeated exposure reinforces the creator's intended meaning. Readers identify a character with slanted eyes as Asian because the idea was planted hundreds of years ago, so we have been repeatedly exposed to it. As Nodelman writes, Perception is dependent upon prior experience. All objects are most significantly meaningful in the context of the network of connotations we attach to them, not just personal associations and experience, but also cultural assumptions. Young readers therefore bring contextual information to their understanding of images depicting Asians and Asian Americans. And some of that context is repeated exposure to this racist image in all kinds of media. These images circulate in the same meaning-making milieu as do children's books. According to Norman, pictures exist primarily so that they can assist in the telling of stories. Pictures communicate to the reader information that may or may not be in the text. For example, an illustrator might communicate that a character is Asian by dressing them in traditional clothing, coloring their skin a little more brown or yellow, and giving them so-called slitted or slanted eyes. Some early picture books depicting Asian people include stere the stereotypical Chinese man in Dr. Seuss's And to Think That I Saw It on Mulberry Street, and the five identical brothers and townspeople in The Five Chinese Brothers. The depiction of the Chinese man in Mulberry Street was selectively revised, but came under fire again in 2017 when the Amazing World of Dr. Seuss Museum mounted a mural display that included the chopsticks, bowl of rice, slanted eyes, wooden shoes, and pointed hat. Seuss's nephew claimed that Seuss used shorthand, implying that he needed an accessible way for readers in the West to read the man as Chinese, who the nephew claimed came from a place that was as far away from the US as you can get. Never mind that by the 1930s, when this book was published, there were almost 7,500 uh, 75,000 people of Chinese descent living in the United States, and there were flourishing Chinatowns in major cities. The Five Chinese Brothers, published one year after Mulberry Street, is the most well-known and still circulating picture book that includes the racist stereotypes of yellow skin and slanted eyes. There are six copies in my own public library. The storyline about five brothers tricking their executioner is catchy, and the brothers look deceptive, deceptively benign with their identical, friendly faces on the cover. However, Junko Yokoda asks, I characters and the five Chinese brothers have to look identical for the story to work. But why is everyone else in the country, as represented by the book, identical in physical appearance, attire, and even the angle at which they lean in a group scene? In 1977, in the Bulletin for the Council on Interracial Books for Children, Albert Schwartz wrote that the book was published while the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act was in effect, and that it drew upon the period's popular, extremely negative stereotypes of the Chinese. He continued, these stereotypes are reflected in the Kurt Weiss illustrations, which are typical of the political cartoons found in the jingoistic US press of the 1930s, and I would add the late 1800s. He then describes some of the stereotypes, which include slit and slanted eyes. <clears throat> Rothio Davis and Dolores de Manuel also criticize the character's stereotypical identical features and slanted eyes in their introduction to the Asian American children's literature special issue of The Lion and the Unicorn. 
Dolores and Emmanuel write that Asian American children's literature is working in its own way to replace the stereotypical depictions of the Asians and Asian Americans that children know best, as in what used to pass for Asian American literature. However, in this particular area, we have a long way to go, and partly because we have so much to undo. The first picture is a political cartoon from Harper's Weekly in the 1880s. The following three images are the story of Ping, and to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street, and the five Chinese brothers. The fifth image is Jean Luen Yang's outrageous caricature, Chinky, in American Born Chinese. Let me be clear, Jean Yang drew on the previous images to, to create Chinky. Min Song put these two images side by side and wrote that Chinky is, quote, the grotesque stereotype of the Chinese as racially alien that first appeared in the 19th century, end quote. That is, in following the racist visuals dominant in the late 19th and early 20th, early 20th century, Jean Yang deliberately drew him with yellow skin and only lines for eyes. That said, I was talking with Jean about this yesterday, and he said he wishes he drew him as more monstrous. Jean said, quote, every now and then someone says that Chinky is cute. I don't want people to think he's cute. He's supposed to be uncomfortable. Uh, he's supposed to be horrifying, end quote. I am both surprised and not surprised that people think Chinky is cute. In the absence of a wider understanding of the historical origins of how slanted eyes, yellow skin, etc., are tied to the racist history of Asian exclusion, how are readers to know that Chinky is not supposed to be read as cute? But those same racial markers, yellow skin, slanted eyes, etc., show up in other children's literature and media. These are pictures I've taken of Asian faces mostly in children's literature that I've gathered over the past few years. In these images, Asians are marked by slanted eyes or only lines for eyes, yellow skin and rice bowl haircuts. Again, these stem from those yellow peril political cartoons and also perpetuate lumping the assumption that all Asians look the same. In her discussion of Asian American picture books, Joanne Yi invokes Robert Park's idea of a racial uniform, demonstrating how these quote, racial uniforms made up of East Asian stereotypes and essentialist markers in the majority of picture books signified Asianness, end quote. Yi, who evaluated over 300 picture books, writes that, quote, an overwhelming majority of the texts with protagonists having Asian racial identities, but not specific heritage affiliations. The Asianness of the characters was evident in their illustrated depictions. Nearly all of the characters had black hair, brown eyes, frequently depicted as small, slanted, almond-shaped, or with eye creases and pale skin, end quote. The use of slanted eyes persists even among hashtag own voices created images. In 2020, after Multicultural Children's Book Day published this illustration, conscious style guy creator Karen Yin asked of the Asian presenting kids, why did he, the artist, choose to draw them so slanted? Is he not aware that eyes drawn with an exaggerated slant is considered a racist caricature in the US? And we know that the illustrator is Asian, um, because his brother tweeted back at us um, trying to defend him. While both Asian and Asian American artists produce racist images, in my observation, Asian artists who were not raised in the United States, and I don't know the background of this guy if he was raised in the United States, tend to produce racist images more often, possibly because they did not grow up with the experiences of being othered with racialized bullying as Asians in the United States did. They do not have the same social context that we do, and, uh, and the majority white publishing industry doesn't catch it when it happens. Asian American readers who know their eyes are not slanted may have a visceral reaction to seeing these images in their books. Nodelman says, quote, children obviously must know enough of their culture to understand the ways in which pictures represent it, end quote. When classmates taunt Asian Americans for their eye shape, which is so common, it is almost a rite of passage among Asian American youth, they know it is meanness. Non-Asian readers are repeatedly exposed to these racist images and are led to believe this is how Asians look. And somewhere, somehow, they also learn to make fun of these so-called slanted eyes, sometimes manifesting in serious racial harassment. This conversation cannot be divorced from the racist rhetoric of the previous administration, when Trump repeatedly used phrases such as Kung flu and Chinese virus instead of COVID-19 and coronavirus, despite being warned repeatedly that such language would lead to anti-Asian sentiment. Over the past year, we have seen an explosion of anti-Asian hate crimes related to the coronavirus. This week, the Stop AAPI Hate website, which is co-organized by Asian American Studies professor Russell Jung, reported over 2,800 incidents of anti-Asian hate through December 2020. One 68-year-old woman reported that a group of construction workers, quote, 
made fun of me by mocking me, fake coughing, spitting at me, and making slant eye gesture, gestures until I asked them to stop." End quote. Remember that Ono and Pham, Pham asked, why do non-Asian and non-Asian American children taunt Asians and Asian Americans by pulling their eyelids back? Somewhere, somehow, those construction workers learned that the slant eye gesture is hurtful, just as spitting on someone is hurtful. In January, Joanne Ho and Dung Ho, not related, published their picture book, Eyes That Kiss in the Corners. This is a lyrical, poetic picture book celebrating Asian eyes that has been enthusiastically received by many in the children's literature community, including Asian Americans. The thing is, um, white people don't have round eyes and all eyes actually kiss in the corners. Still, it's the first picture book that explicitly celebrates Asian eyes. And anecdotally, I can tell it's already doing a lot to counter the images of slanted eyes on Asian faces. Attention to how Asian eyes are depicted in children's literature has been mentioned in some youth literature research, but more thorough and nuanced discussions are still emergent. Meanwhile, as I've demonstrated, these images continue to appear in children's books. One other way that Asian Americans are othered and orientalized in children's literature is through food. Depictions might be overt stereotypes or exotic, but, or, or exotic and somewhat superficial. In the introduction to Eating Asian America, Robert Koo, Anita Manor, and Martin Manalansan write, quote, Asians in the United States have long been associated, often reluctantly or against their will, as well as voluntarily or with pleasure, with images of and practices regarding food, end quote. They continue, food is intimately connected to the histories, cultures, and communities of Asian Americans. Food is not just about food. Landong analyzes how food-related scenes in Fifth Chinese Daughter and Farewell to Manzanar are, quote, examples in which Chinese American and Japanese American children come to terms with their ethnic identity through food consumption, as well as through cooking and dining customs, end quote. On Books for Littles, um, in a post titled Don't Yuck My Yum, a Shia writes, quote, when we ask, have you eaten yet? It's a check-in to say, I wanna know how you're doing and I care about you. Feeding our kids is how we show we love them. It's how we connect them to our cultural heritage. It's how we create an environment for a happy, comfortable, and safe childhood. This, the disproportionate focus on how different our food is promotes AAPI stereotypes. This is a direct result of the racist, xenophobic, anti-immigration laws that targeted Chinese and other AAPI immigrants until 1965, and how depictions of our food, and by extension us, as dirty and unhealthy, continue the bias against that seeps into how we're perceived in education, the workforce, and housing applica applications, end quote. Making fun of Asian food is not just about food. It is a part of a larger system of xenophobia. In popular culture, Asian food has become more commonplace due to shows such as the late Anthony Bourdain's Parts Unknown and Asian American celebrity chefs Jet Tila and Roy Choi. But when in the hands of less informed people, Asian food can and is mangled. Consider the backlash when Bon Appetit posted a video featuring a white man titled, PSA, this is how you should be eating pho. Consider the response when a Star Tribune, when the Star Tribune, a Minnesota newspaper, reported that the Minneapolis school district was dishing out kimchi to stretch students' taste buds. Whose taste buds? My Korean daughters? And while some readers were enthusiastic, one reader wrote, get them used to eating rotten cabbage. You probably know that kimchi is not rotten cabbage. According to Hanyang University in Seoul, Quote, in order to preserve food against decomposition, especially during winter, Korean ancestors came up with the means of drying food to prevent rotting. Then a more sophisticated method was discovered, which was fermenting by satisfying both conditions of long durability and nutrition. Making and storing kimchi became a common practice. Kimchi is a staple of a Korean meal. However, this staple Korean food is othered in American picture books. Baby's Canny Kimchi was written and illustrated by white women and published by Bloomsbury in 2006. The conflict is that the unnamed Korean protagonist has just acquired a new baby sister, but she can't do or eat anything, the first being kimchi. The older sister lists spaghetti, popcorn, and strawberry ice cream as other foods the baby cannot eat. So it's not that kimchi itself is grotesque and inedible, but rather that babies can't eat a lot of things. But why is the book titled Babies Can't Eat Kimchi instead of Babies Can't Eat Ice Cream or Babies Can't Eat Popcorn? Focusing on kimchi overemphasizes its inedibility. On her website, the author posted a photo with two Korean girls with a caption, quote, here I am with two beautiful and beautifully costumed Korean uh, girls at my Korean grocery in Queens. I love to take advantage of the many ethnic stores that surround my neighborhood, 
especially when I can be working on my books at the same time, that I am finding exotic and delicious treats for supper. I started shopping at the Korean supermarket as soon as Nancy passed and I began to work on Babies Can't Eat Kimchi just to get into the mood, end quote. Costumed, exotic, opportunistic consumption. This is textbook tourism. She was not conducting research. She was being a tourist. No Kimchi for Me was written and illustrated by Adam Kim. It has been well reviewed and widely promoted. In this picture book, Kim portrays Kimchi as it has historically and often contemporarily been depicted in popular American media, stinky and spicy. Kim writes, Yumi does not like stinky, spicy Kimchi. The use of the word stinky is racially charged and socially irresponsible as it gives permission and language to readers to repeat it to insult our food. When Yumi tries it at lunchtime, she spits it out and says, yuck. Her older brothers taunt her for being a baby, so Yumi tries different ways to eat kimchi, on a cookie, on pizza, on ice cream. By the way, kimchi is really good on pizza. Nothing works, and again, she shouts, arg, I hate kimchi, in big, bold letters. But then Yumi's grandmother makes kimchi in the form of a pancake, and Yumi declares that it's still spicy, but yummy. The existence of these two books with the words kimchi and negatives, can't and no, in the titles is race fatiguing. This attitude toward kimchi as stinky and inedible is race fatiguing. The fact that no kimchi for me was created by a Korean person is disappointing. We need to have conversations about internalized racism and how we as Asian Americans are often complicit in perpetuating stereotypes such as slanted eyes and that our foods are so-called stinky and inedible. Here are some picture books that present kimchi differently. Peeping Bop is written by Linda Sue Park and illustrated by Hobe. Lee. A little girl and her mother prepare pipimbap, a traditional Korean rice dish typically with vegetables and meat. Kimchi doesn't figure prominently in this book. The story is more about preparing the main dish. However, as a staple part of a Korean meal, kimchi is on the table. It is normalized. The cover of Juna's Jar by Jane Bach and illustrated by Felicia Hoshino features a little Korean girl gazing into an empty kimchi jar. The, readers, the reader learns that Juna's family always had a large jar of kimchi in their fridge. After they finished eating all the, all the kimchi, Juna sometimes got to keep the empty jar. The narrator continues, quote, Juna loved to take the jar and go on adventures with her best friend, Hector. They went to the park near their apartment building to collect colorful, colorful rocks and small bugs, end quote. But then suddenly Hector moves away, leaving Juna alone and sad. This book is about friendship and the imagination and uses the kimchi jar to connect Juna and Hector. Juna works through her grief by imagining traveling through the kimchi jar, a common object in a Korean home, in search for her friend. Chef Roy Choi and the Street Food Remix is written by Jacqueline Briggs Martin and June Jo Lee and illustrated by the graffiti artist Man Won. This award-winning information book tells the story of Chef Roy Choi, who created the Kogi food truck. The narrator explains, quote, Roy loved his mom's food made the Korean way by hand. Briny and tangy kimchi, spicy pibimbap, scallion pancakes. Her kimchi was so special, friends bought it from the trunk of her car. So popular, his parents opened a restaurant. They continue, to Roy, the family restaurant was the best good place. In these three picture books, kimchi is depicted in various ways and most importantly as normal. When I do workshops with librarians, I encourage them to consider these three books first before they consider the first two, so that the first impression readers will have of kimchi is that it's a normal part of a Korean meal. I ask them to consider the impact of reading a line such as, arg, I hate kimchi, what, what impact that will have on a Korean child or a non-Korean audience. Circling back to the Pulgugi story from the beginning of my talk, The Invisible Boy is a picture book about Brian, a quiet boy invisible at school until Justin, a new Korean kid, shows up. Justin is hyper-visible because he knew, and the kids are trying to figure out if he's cool. And then later, he becomes a spectacle when the other kids see what he's brought for lunch. Justin ex explains that it's Pulgugi, that it's good, but they call it Boogergi and laugh. Brian wonders if being invisible or being laughed at is worse. In his quiet way, he writes Justin a note saying he thought the pulgogi looked good. The two become friends, but the other kids who aren't so disgusted by the pulgogi, they still wanna play with Justin. Justin brings Brian along and everyone is happy. The discussion guide at the end of the book focuses mostly on Brian and his invisibility. One question asks what Brian did to help Justin feel better, focusing on Brian's action rather than Justin's situation. 
Returning back to our earlier conversation about how eyes are rendered, notice how in both these scenes, Justin's eyes are different from those of his classmates. There are other visual and textual clues that Justin is Korean, his black hair, the bulgogi, etc. So I would say we don't need eyes that are too egregiously small and slanted to characterize him. In her influential text, Asian American Literature, Elaine Kim writes, quote, stereotypes of racial minorities are a record of prejudices. They are part of an attempt to justify various attitudes and practices. The function of stereotypes of Asians in Anglo American literature has been to provide literary rituals through which myths of white racial supremacy might be continually reaffirmed to the everlasting detriment of the Asian, end quote. There is a clear connection between the ways in which children's literature that dehumanize Asians and Asian Americans is amplified by Donald Trump's racist comments about the coronavirus. In both similar and distinct ways, both dehumanize and fuel racism against Asians and Asian Americans. Using Min Song's measure of critical acclaim, given what I've shared about awards and publication, um, data. Today, Asian American children's books might indeed be in a golden age, but I push back on this by turning to the specific topics of representations of slanted eyes and Korean food in children's books, revealing that persistent stereotypes continue to distort our stories. Could we say that the creators of the existing body of Asian American youth literature are worthy of being called a celebrated cohort? Yes, we've earned a lot of awards, but overall this body of literature still suffers from erasures and distortions, some at the hands of Asian and Asian American creators. Stakeholders in Asian American children's literature communities need to speak up about these stereotypes, and we need to speak up when our fellow Asian American artists misrepresent us, circling and circling back to the airport story I told earlier, when our non-Asian American colleagues say unkind things about our food. You also can play a role in this. When you see an inaccurate image in a children's book or other media, read the whole book and evaluate that image in the context of the entire story and other illustrations. Not all books with kimchi are bad, and not all books that employ small lines or lines for eyes are bad. But because of their origins and how their meanings have been constructed over time, we should ask questions such as, how is the kimchi depicted? Who has agency? How are the eyes rendered? And how are they rendered compared to other eyes in the book? or other books in your display or program or collection. Ask what impact you think this book will have on an Asian American reader, or what impression of Asian Americans this book will have on non-Asian American readers. Given the history of othering, and given the current climate of anti-Asian racism, it's worth pausing to ask these questions. If it still makes you uncomfortable, speak up to the teacher, librarian, store owner, publisher, whoever, Second, if you find a children's book that does a good job of depicting Asians and Asian Americans, buy it. Gift it to a kid, an Asian kid, any kid. Display it at your library, read it to your students, include it in your programming. Tell people about it. Money talks and publishers pay attention when their books do well. It is fitting that this topic is shared as part of the Augusta Baker lecture series. Baker devoted a great deal of her energy to ensuring that black children saw positive images of themselves in children's books, and not just black children. As the University of South Carolina website says, quote, she worked tire tirelessly throughout her career to diversify the genre of children's literature and to make uh, books for children and young adults more reflective of the people who read them, end quote. Baker would also care that Asian American children saw positive images of themselves in children's books, that all children got to see positive, diverse, high quality images of one another in their media. As more Asian Americans write children's books as we are projected to do, I hope we'll see a greater variety of perspectives on our experiences. For now, the persistence of slanted eyes and the othering of our food is painful, partly because the body of counter narratives is still small but relatively small. We are quite literally hungry for more and better, better stories depicting our foods, our bodies, and our communities with respect, nuance, and authenticity. I hope that this presentation provides you with a greater understanding of the pitfalls of Asian American youth literature, while also pointing to the many possibilities and the richness of our stories. I also hope that this presentation causes you to think about your own role in continuing the dialogue and work with your colleagues and readers, and also with writers, illustrators, and publishers as you demand better books for your libraries and schools. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was fantastic. 
Uh, lots to think about. And there are a few questions um, in the chat. So the first question uh, that was posted a few slides ago, um, but is there a link for the study that you mentioned um, about Asian picture book descriptions? Picture book descriptions? Um, are, are they talking so, about the CCBC or what? Sorry, which? I'm not sure. I wonder if perhaps they're talking about the conscious style guide. It was on oh, that uh -huh. slide. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure if the link they're referring to is the conscious style guide. And I was going to share that as the answer, but I wasn't sure I did want to ask um, just to confirm if that was the link. Yeah, if that's what they're talking about, we can certainly um, link to the Conscious Style Guide. And I should also say that APALA, the um, Asian Pacific American Library and Asso Libraries Association, um, we have a task force that is working on a rubric um, to, uh, that we will publicly share on the website that will provide guide guidelines and definitions and things like that um, on how to evaluate children's books for Asian American content that uh, we've been working on that for like half a year hopefully it'll be out soon great um another question could you share more examples of picture books that portray asian americans positively mm -hmm. oh there are a lot i mean i gave the example of ice that kiss in the corners but like here i am now turning around to my own i have like a stack over there um i would say that you know like Drawn Together is one of the first that come to mind, obviously, um, by, by uh, Min Lei and Dan Santat. Um, and then Grace Lin's recent picture books, such as um, uh, Big Mooncake for Little Snow. Wait, is that the title? But her, her um, Call to Cut Honor award-winning picture book. Um, there, I, I would refer you to the Social Justice Books website, which has um, a lot of uh, vetted book lists as well as um, The Conscious Kid has a lot of really great book lists. And We Are the People, the um, summer reading lists that Edie Campbell, Laura Jimenez, and other scholars put together. Um, those are like lots of different, um, very diverse in many different ways, uh, book lists, but they, you know, an Asian American is one of them. So that's another one that I would recommend. But it's really, it's always hard to answer this question. Like, can you recommend like good Asian American, but there, you know, there's like 400 published every year and a lot of them are very good. Um, but yeah, there, there are a lot of really good ones out there. Great. Um, one was, what was the book um, by Elaine Kim? And I also wrote down Elaine oh. Kim. Asian American <laughs> literature. It is a like foundational text for anyone who's studying Asian American literature in general, whether it's children's books or um, books written for adult audiences. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, lots of uh, folks saying that they enjoyed the talk and thank you. Um, I'm looking back to make sure that we don't miss any questions here. Uh, folks are saying they learned so much. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge, inspiring presentation. Okay, here's a question, Dr. Dolan. What are your thoughts on the responsibilities of BIPOC book creators to only portray their own racial cultural identities positively? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because um, people should be free to write about anything, um, you know, creative license and in the ways that they want. And the thing is, not all of our experience have been positive, right? And so in what ways do we um, portray certainness of our experiences? And, you know, like an example I'll give is that there is an awful lot of anti-Blackness within Asian American communities. And how often do we see that showing up in children's literature? Are we reckoning with it in our children's and young adult books, right? Um, so I think um, I'll give Jean Wen Yang's American Born Chinese as, as an example of um, a book that deals, I think, really in really, really complex ways with sort of like um, internalized racism, right? Because one of the, the threads of this story is a character who does not like being Asian, right? And so I think, you know, a lot of it has to do with craft. How are you telling the story? Um, and what is the final message from the book? You know, like, I don't, 
think that the final message should be that it's okay to hate ourselves and to hate our Asianness, but if there is like a very compelling and creative and like well-written way that that can be told as a story, then I think that that is, um, that, that is quite a feat. Um, and I would point you to Min Song's writings on this book. Um, Min Hyung Song has written a chapter on it in his book, uh, the Children of 1965, and he also has um, an article that was published elsewhere. I don't remember where, but if you find look him up, you can find it. Um, and he really like gets at like the history of where these um, images have come from, and just like the Amer Asian American like identity formation of the characters in the book. So yeah, I think I don't think we should be pressured to write only about our positive experiences, but I do believe that we need a balance of stories so that they're not just positive or just negative. There's an awful lot of things that have happened to us and a lot, a lot of things that we have also done um, that, um, that we need to talk about. And an example I'll give is the LA uprisings, um, the Asian black uh, tensions that I have not seen a whole lot of people writing about from the from an Asian American perspective. Um, and I, you know, and I hope that someday we'll see, we'll see books on that topic. Great, um, thank you. Uh, here is another great question. Appreciation for how Dr. Dolan encouraged people to start with accurate representation instead of starting from a place of harm. So often I hear people defend books with poor representation as good for discussion. Uh, but why would you start that discussion from a place of harm and inaccuracy? So I guess that's not necessarily a question, but a comment and something that I, I agree with too. And I've, and I've heard um, a good bit myself, um, just that, you know, a lot of times when there's a book that has a misrepresentation that we, we say, yes, still read it. Um, it's good for discussion. Um, but starting out with a book that's got a positive representation um, first makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I think especially for young people who, if they don't have a certain, you know, like demographic in their community, and this is actually their first time encountering an other, right? Like having that first impression that it's, it's such an important moment, right? And so, for example, like my daughter, I know that she's going to learn about Little House on the Prairie someday, someday. She's seven years old right now. But those, we don't have those books in our house. <laughs> They're in my office so that she can't see them. And we read Louise Erdrich, The Birch Bark House. And we read, you know, um, Carol Lindstrom, We Are Water Protectors and Jingle Dancer. And uh, We Are Grateful and Bow Wow Pow Wow and Fry Bread so that she sees first like all these contemporary images of indigenous people. Um, and then also, you know, like the that time period that Louise Erdrich is writing about so that that is her first impression of indigenous people before she becomes exposed to Little House, right? So yeah, I completely agree. Start with those positive representations first. Yeah, I love that. Um, here's another comment slash question. It seems like there are a lot of Asian American books that feature Korean, Chinese, or Japanese characters. Why aren't there more books about Southeast Asian cultures like Vietnam, Cambodia, um, Thailand and Laos, it feels like there is sort of a classism divide in the number of books published about those countries. That's absolutely true. And if you go to the Apollo Talk Story website where we have been creating or we have been putting up bibliographies of Asian American children's books, um, and the reason why I didn't recommend it the first, like in the first round of questioning, um, is because we put up books even if some of them were um, a little bit controversial, but right now we're revamping that website and um, we're, we're working on um, making sure that it's a more selective list. But if you look at that, uh, you will see Putin is very short. Uh, Vietnamese is very short. Laos, like, I don't even know how many books we have that, you know, probably like th four. Um, compared to Chinese American, Asian, um, Japanese American, even Korean American, the Chinese list is like super, super long. Um, it has to do partly with patterns of immigration because Chinese Americans have been in this country a lot longer than Southeast Asians. Um, as I shared about the immigration um, laws, you know, there were so many Chinese in the 1800s that they actually created an, an, an anti-Chinese like immigration law, right? The Chinese Exclusion Act, because they wanted to keep them out. 
um, and then 1924 cut it off for everybody. And 1965 is when like more Asian Americans were able to come and it was mostly East Asians. Um, and then because of the Vietnam War and the displacement, it, you know, there was a, a later pattern of immigration um, for Southeast Asian communities. Um, I really hope that now that there has more time has passed and communities have become more settled, that we will see more writings emerge out of the Southeast Asian community. And I think we can look at Bao Fi and Min Lei and Kao Kalia Yang as examples of that happening. I mean, with Bao's book winning a Caldecott and Min Lei's winning, you know, the Apollo um, Children's Literature Award. And with Viet, Nguyen, uh, Viet Thanh Nguyen winning the Pulitzer Prize, I mean, Vietnamese Americans are incredible writers. And I think it's just a matter of time before we see more. But if you want to see more writings from Southeast Asians, buy Min's books, buy Bao's books, buy Kalia Yang's books. That's going to tell publishers that these are stories that we want to hear. So, yeah. This is my question, just kind of piggybacking off what you just said. You know, when we talk about diversity and we talk about black authors and illustrators, and we often recommend that folks seek out um, black owned bookshops and, and publishers and such, what, what bookshops, what recommendations do you have for publishers to kind of seek out and look at in terms of Asian American or Asian um, literature? What publishers? Um, yeah, I, so I think it's really exciting that um, we have things like Heart Drum and um, Versify and Kokila. And Kokila has actually been doing really great with their books, um, with their Asian American content. And so like Tina Cho's The Ocean Calls is such a gorgeous picture book. Um, that's one that I would really recommend for people to look at. So I think Kokila is doing a really great job. Um, you know, the thing with the big five publishers is that they're, they have so many books that they are going to do like some good ones, right? And some not so great ones. Um, but I think it's also important to look at where the publishers are, right? Like Phoebe Ye um, is at Crown and she does great books. Um, Alvina Ling works with Grace Lynn and Alvina Little Brown does really phenomenal Asian American children's books. And of course, like I would be really remiss if I didn't talk about Lee and Lo and just the job that the work that they have done over the past few decades in bringing us high quality diverse books, right? Um, for all different age categories. I mean, um, Axie O's Rebel Soul is one of my favorite fantasy novels. Um, and she's got a sequel and now she's got her third book coming out. And, you know, she's one of those authors that like I follow because I love her writing. And she was published by Lee and Lowe by two books. Um, so yeah, I would definitely look to Lee and Lo um, as a leader in doing that and then follow some of the publishers like if you look at your favorite authors and illustrators and see who they publish with because sometimes they publish repeatedly with the same publishers then you know that that publisher is probably gonna um, you know have some good books behind them and then also the reverse is also true right like if you see some publishers publishing like you know sketchy books then you might want to have a more critical eye to, to the other books that come out of that same publisher. Great, thank you. Um, I think we just have time for a couple more questions. Um, what are what is your view of retellings of traditional Asian folk tales with artwork rendered in the traditional ways? Um, so one of my favorite picture books is. Um, Where's Harmony, written and illustrated by Julie Kim. And it's sort of this like graphic novel format um, and it, it invokes a lot of traditional Korean aesthetics. And I wish I had it with me, but I think it's downstairs because <laughs> my daughter reads it. I mean, there was a period of time where she like wanted to read it every night for bed and that just, you know. Um, but I, I love it when that happens because I, I can immediately apply, um, it, it's a familiar, like aesthetic to me, right? And so, you know, I think that when, um, you know, like uh, When You Trap a Tiger by Tay Keller also invokes traditional Korean folk tales a little bit. And I just, I think it's beautiful when, when that happens. My concern would be um, if there was an imbalance of folk tales compared to traditional, um, or I'm sorry, con contemporary stories or other genres um, and formats. So, yeah, I, 
you know, folklore is an important part of our culture and it should continue to be included in our body of literature. It just shouldn't dominate because then that would make us into like mystical creatures who are, you know, it would further dehumanize us basically because it makes us into not real um, humans. And I think this will be the last question. Uh, how do you think the growing diversity of Asian American authors will affect the depictions you spoke about in terms of Asian bodies and food? Um, how will the growing diversity of Asian American authors? I mean, I just hope that it gets better. Like having a more diverse cohort means that more diverse stories can be told. Um, and so, like I worry that publishers receive manuscripts and then publish the ones that are palatable to them, that they understand because they are also used to slanted eyes or they also don't like kimchi or whatever. Um, but as if they receive more manuscripts that depict a more diverse variety of like, diverse variety, <laughs> depict um, like more diversity within our perspectives, then that can only be a good thing. And, you know, like, Viet Nguyen talks about the narrative burden, like if there, you know, are only so many books and they have to carry that burden of telling all of our stories, then that is too much weight for this one story to carry. But if you've got a lot of books that tell a lot of different stories, then that, you know, it spreads the burden around. And so I'm hoping that we'll get to that place where, you know, it, we're not going to rely on these five picture books that I talked about today and their depictions of kimchi, um, but that there will be just so much more um, and so much more from our perspectives and so much more that that doesn't other us in the same way. Well, thank you so much. I think this was awesome, very inspiring. And I, I really am walking away with the idea of sharing uh, positive depictions first and then mm -hmm you know, going, um, reading more after that, but hopefully there will be more positive depictions uh, coming soon. And just to um, uh, mention some of the things in chat, Dr. Cook posted Dr. Dolan's website, and there will be a recording of Dr. Dolan's talk next week at the um, Baker Diversity Series on the website. Um, also, there, there were many more questions posted, but we did not have time to get to them all, and we will uh, forward the others to you. Um, and then, uh, so many thanks to you for joining us today. It was so good to see you. Uh, and and Does for everyone else, everyone else who attended, thank you so much for being here. I hope that you will all um, be back for the next lecture next week, which is with Ralph McDaniels. And I hope that you all um, stay warm and stay well. And thank you again for being here with us. Thank you, everyone. Bye.